Good evening, everybody. My name is Kim Dorman. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for Princeton Public Library, and I'm delighted that you're here to join us this evening for the third and final in the series about election, this election that uh, we are very grateful to Ingrid Reed for organizing. I want to take just a quick moment to orient you to the space. I think many of you by now are quite familiar with it. We have the chat feature to the side. Uh, as you can see, it says, welcome, everyone. There's a note from uh, Ms. Wakefield. And that will be closed during the panel discussion, but I'll leave it open for a minute or so more in case you have any troubles. Throughout the entire program, you can ask a question using the ask a question button at the bottom. Um, there's a little one there at the moment. And we will try and get to all of your questions or as many questions as possible at the uh, end of the program around 720, generally speaking. If you're having any troubles with your audio or video or if it's laggy, uh, there is underneath where it says live, you can get audio video help, and then you can enter compatibility mode. Uh, that also goes for the speakers, which I forgot to mention <laughs> when I was talking to you in the green room. Um, and that will, should help with any sort of, it like sort of helps buffering. And that's basically all I have in terms of housekeeping for you this evening. Uh, we are delighted again, Ingrid Reed, as always, to partner with you on absolutely anything, but particularly this election series, which is needed so much. Um, help for us to understand what's happening. Uh, Ms. Reed, Ms. Reed, Mrs. Reed was the uh, director of the Eagleton, New Jersey project and was recently chaired the board of New Jersey Spotlight and serves on the community advisory board of NJTV and the advocacy committee of NJ. AARP, and I will leave it to her to introduce the other panelists. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you, Kim. We couldn't do it without you. Uh, welcome to the third session. Uh, we called it What Happened, uh, and I think we have to say what is happening because we're not really done yet in New Jersey. And we'll devote the first part of, of our program to sort of giving a recap of uh, what is both interesting and what is good information. And then we'll switch and start thinking about uh, 2021. Uh, as we now all know very well, elections have consequences, but also in New Jersey, we never stop. So we have to think about the next election while we're finishing up the, the current election. Uh, I'm delighted to have um, a great panel with us this after, uh, this evening, and and we'll go in this order. And I've asked each one of the panelists to to give you a uh, take in a special um, uh, kind of sl uh, slant of what was happening in uh, in this election. We're going to start with Ben Dworkin, who is an alumnus <laughs> of a lot of things, but also of the Princeton <laughs> Adult School uh, program where uh, the question I'm going to ask him, and he's going to answer it in five minutes. He used to spend an hour lecturing about it. Uh, <laughs> and, then, and then we'll turn to John Weingart. Uh, oh, um, um, ben is the a professor and director of the Rowan University Institute for Public Policy and Citizenship. Then we'll turn to John Weingart, um, who is associate director of the Eagleton Institute and its center on the American governor, which is going to be uh, an important um uh, distinction to have as we move into electing the governor next year. Uh, and then I want to welcome Henel Patel, Director of the uh, Democracy and Justice Program at the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice, because there are a lot of issues that the Institute has been working on that, that were first in this election. And, um, and she has a lot of good experience having clerked for Chief Justice Rabner and worked on a redistricting um, staff person when she was at law school, and she was an Eagleton Fellow, as as was, I should say, Ben Dworkin. And we're not going to say what date he was an Eagleton Fellow. <laughs> and then finally, we turn to our hometown guy, uh, Charlie Stiles, who's a political com uh, columnist mm -hmm. and is with The Record uh, and USA Today, and, um, and, and sort of ask him to say, well, what was the media covering? What did they find interesting? And um, what are they still covering since this election isn't over? That'll be the first half of the program, and then we'll take a, uh, we'll switch and take a look ahead. So I'm going to turn now first. Ben, can you give us a quick overview of, of what what do we think has happened in New Jersey in this election? <laughs> thank you, uh, Ingrid, and thank you to all the other panelists and for everybody who's part of the uh, program tonight. Uh, it's great to be with you. So first, a caveat. 
We're still Nailing. counting. Nailing. Uh, so all these numbers and know. understanding of what we're doing uh, is, you know, are bound to creep and change a little bit, uh, creep up and, and change a little bit. But here's what we can say about what happened in New Jersey. We voted. Uh, in the end, probably about 4.6 million ballots will be cast. This is 70% of all registered voters. Uh, mm -hmm. And at 70%, we're going to probably be on par with where the country is. Uh, this mm -hmm. was a, a huge turnout uh, mm -hmm. level. This is far more than we had four years ago. Um, other things we learned. It takes time. You know, the state allowed the early counting of vote by mail ballots, uh, and this helped us a lot. Uh, it didn't seem to create some of the nightmare scenarios that some people were worried about, uh, leaking of the uh, where votes stood prior to election day. Um, but what it also helped us do, the early counting of our vote by mails as they at a certain point prior to election day was that um, we got it done. Uh, we, we got we got through it. At least there was a head start uh, to keep things going, and this made us very different than, say, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan, uh, where they didn't open up the vote by mails, of which they got a lot, but they didn't open up till election day morning, uh, and just started counting millions of ballots there, which is why we saw the waiting. Um, all of this time waiting for results is very disorienting. And I think we should just appreciate that in our lives today, everything goes faster. It's all about instant messaging. Uh, it's 24 seven access and be able to order anything at any time uh, of day. You have the, even when you watch the news, there's other news rolling across the bottom of the screen because what you're watching is not fast enough in order to get things. And so when you tell somebody you have to wait, um, we generally, you know, apply this to giving birth or mourning mm -hmm. the passing of someone. Um, those things take time. And what we're now adding to that list is counting the votes and figure out who won an election. It simply is weird because everything is supposed to go faster. Um, and yet this does it. What did we also learn? Uh, we really adopted the vote by mail system here in New Jersey. Uh, the number, the last number I saw was at 4.4 million vote by mail ballots uh, will have been uh, turned in. We've never done this before in New Jersey, so it's hard to compare it to anything. But I think that was an astronomical number. We also saw that the adoption of vote by mail uh, ballots and as a way of engaging in the voting process varies by community. It works well among suburban uh, communities less so among urban ones. This probably has a lot to do uh, with uh, communities of people of color traditionally not trusting vote by mail uh, as compared to white voters for a whole host of historical reasons. Um, what we didn't see, we didn't see endless lines on election day, which some of us thought uh, uh, might come because if you voted in a uh, in person on election day, you had to fill out this provisional ballot, which meant you had to do it by hand, which takes time. So it's not a matter of, oh, I'm getting in there and there was no, unless you had a certain uh, disabilities, you didn't able to just go into a booth and go click, 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 and you're done. Now you had to fill it. You had to do all these things, circle in this, uh, you know, with a pen or pencil, that would have taken time. And so we thought we might see these long lines. Um, we didn't. And one reason was that so many people voted by mail. So the total number of people casting ballots in person on election day was rather small. Uh, and the other reasons we didn't see the long lines is that people came with their ballots. They came with them more like, I filled it out. I didn't want to mail it. I didn't want to put it in a drop box. So I'm handing it off to you. And you just move the line faster. Um, a couple quick things just on the results uh, that we saw. Okay, what did we learn from New Jersey? We voted for Biden in a big way. Uh, he got 58% of the vote as of now. Uh, and this is compared to Hillary Clinton four years ago, who got 55% of the vote. Trump got just over 41% uh, this time, pretty much had the same number uh, last time. The other thing we learned is that you know, congressional races in New Jersey are pivotal to Republican control of the House of Representatives. 
after the last um, after the last census uh, back in 2010, we went through a redistricting congressional redistricting process, um, and the intention was really to create a six-six partisan split. There were six Republican districts and six Democratic districts uh, of the 12 in New Jersey. After 2018's elections, it was 11 to one for the Democrats. Um, when Jeff Van Drew switched his party from Democrat to Republican, it became 10 to two. So if the GOP is gonna come back and take back the House, they, start to, they need to win more seats in New Jersey. Um, so let's just look quickly at these congressional races. New Jersey, second congressional district, Jeff Van Drew against Amy Kennedy, very high profile. And the district went for Van Drew uh, as a Republican this time. The Van Drew brand is, is so significant down in that area. This is buttressed by a 25 year career and about probably upwards of $15 million that has been sent building <laughs> up the Jeff Van Drew brand that it was simply more, uh, it overwhelmed the Kennedy uh, brand, as it were, uh, with Amy Kenny, who married into the famous Kennedy political clan. And in fact, Jeff Andrew did better than President Trump in that district. Um, that's how much significant personal strength he had as a candidate there. So that uh, remains in Republican hands. Um, the New Jersey's third congressional district, Andy Kim, the incumbent, first term Democrat against uh, uh, Richter, David Richter. The district went for Andy Kim and he won re-election. This is the New Jersey third congressional district is the tale of two counties, uh, the very deep red ocean county and the larger in terms of population and increasingly blue Burlington County. And effectively what you saw is that Andy Kim ran up such a big margin in Burlington County uh, he won it by 15% more than he won his race uh, two years ago. Uh, such a huge margin there that he overwhelmed anything that came out of uh, Ocean County. And that's why I think I just saw he's the first Democrat in a century to be reelected uh, in right. this district. Um, finally, uh, New Jersey's 7th Congressional District. This was another high profile, very expensive race. Tom Malinowski, first-term Democratic incumbent, against Tom Kane Jr., the Senate Republican leader, uh, son of the former governor. Look, the Associated Press called this on election night. Uh, a lot of other media outlets have not yet called it. Mathematically, it is possible for Kane to win. There are still votes being counted, but he's going to have to significantly overperform in the Democratic counties. There are four counties that make up, pieces of four counties that make up this district. And Tom Kane, the Republican, is going to have to overperform in these Democratic counties in order to um, overcome the margin that Tom Malinowski currently has over him. Uh, at least now, I don't think that's going to happen. It'll get closer. Um, but I think we're going to, most people expect Tom Malinowski to return yeah. to Washington uh, there. It's and finally, let yeah. me just yeah, last one, last one, quickly. Uh, New Jersey 11th District, Mikey Sherrill against, um, God, I forget her first name is Betchy, uh, was her Rose last Smith. name. Thank you. Um, Sherrill won this pretty easily. Again, she's a first term Democrat, and that's just why I wanted to mention it. Um, the fact that she won it so easily is stunning, given that this is the heart of Morris County, which Trenton insiders would joke was constitutionally Republican, like no Democrat is ever gonna win there. And now they are, uh, now it's all competitive. It's much more competitive. Um, part of it is just that uh, a lot of the new Democrats in the state are moving to places like Morris County and turning what was Republican to a Democratic, uh, more of a competitive area. And the other part is just Mikey Sherrill herself, uh, who's an outstanding uh, candidate and just seems to be the right woman at the right time in the right district. So that's what we saw in New Jersey. Good, thanks, uh, Ben. And I think we should dock it probably a, a little discussion about the performance of the uh, the Republican Party in um, in New Jersey um, in this in this election. Uh, ask the question of what were they doing as we look ahead to what might happen in two thousand twenty one. Okay, John, you had a morning after program that was quite lively at Eagleton. 
and we scheduled this one a day later so you could tell us what people were saying <laughs> you know, all the ideas. let me just say yeah. a little bit picking up where ben left off in the new jersey congressional races i was struck and i i don't know whether this is more coincidence than data but the pathway to become a member of Congress in New Jersey is to not be in the state legislature at the moment. So we have five new members, counting Josh Gottheimer, who was just finishing a second term. Um, only Van Drew came from the legislature. The other four came from out of nowhere and suddenly got elected. And all of them, the four Democrats, I think have a pretty high profile in Washington very quickly and a very highly respected for their knowledge right. well they're not all that well known in new jersey because they weren't legislators they weren't weren't hanging out in trenton whereas the other seven members in the new jersey delegation who've been there longer most of them came from the legislature um uh, I, and i also want to mention just because nobody does that we had a senate race in new jersey and uh, there was no there was no suspense and cory booker got reelected. it continues this streak or trend or reality that new jersey last elected a republican senator the same year that joe biden got into the senate in 1972 clifford case got reelected, and a republican hasn't been elected to the senate any time since then i think from the morning after discussion one thing that uh, was not dominant but it was powerful to me was um, what a difficult job the Democrats are going to have to try to be a unified party going forward and how there are uh, people drawing completely contradictory lessons from the data as we have it now and there'll be more data that people can pick and choose with but you know was it the 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 people members of Congress who were more moderate who were the ones who got reelected on Tuesday, um or was it the ones who were more activist or that's not quite the right word more progressive i guess you'd say um and uh we don't know but the but whatever it was it's a pretty it's only a little more than half of the members of the house of representatives and a little less than half in the senate maybe um so i think as republicans had that problem and maybe they'll have it again but they they all went over to the trump world in past couple of years. Um, but that I think is going to be a big, a big problem for, um, for Democrats going forward. Um, I think um, one th uh, I'm impressed, and it's not just with this election, but the last year or two or three, or maybe it's a Trump gift, how much, how politically literate so many more people are, such a large percentage of the public of people right. yeah. we were you know and i mean there's so many people on a first name basis with steve kornacki which used to be just some of us but with, <laughs> with, with rachel you know with the news with the commentators and knowing the names of the senators and you know in in states that aren't their own and, and i don't know what that means except that being on a panel like this is more daunting than it might otherwise be <laughs> What can you say? People haven't <laughs> thought of already. Um, but the, I guess the final thing I'll say is about going back to the extremes of the party or the uh, the wings of the party that are as opposed to the, the center of it. So I was struck by a, an article, I think, I guess, in the New York Times today about the Georgia Senate races and how much hangs in the balance and how there was a time when it wouldn't have been all that significant. When if the Senate was 48-48 and it was gonna become maybe 50 or gonna be, you know, one party was gonna have a majority, a, a narrow majority, the, the conclusion would have been, well, the moderate senators of both parties are gonna be the force of, of power. That decisions are gonna, laws are gonna get passed if you get, the, I don't know, Jacob Javits or you get the, the, the the moderates in both parties and that doesn't exist now i mean so that so that it is for as far as one can see into the future a pitched battle where um a candidate certainly for a republican and maybe for a democrat who who um tries to find a, co a compromise or or a collaboration with uh, people in the other party is going to risk being ostracized by her own party, his own party. So I'll stop uh, there. Just, 
Uh, John, I wanted to follow up on your observation about the uh, the newer members of the uh, um, the congressional delegation not coming out of the legislature. It, it seems to me that they also didn't come out of the political party structure, and that in all of the cases where the they were the new people on the outside, they really had to sort of develop their own political following that helped them get them elected, and it engaged a lot of they were forced to engage a lot of sort of ordinary people uh, at the local level. And, the, and, and then after that, go to the party leaders to be endorsed. It was like a second step as opposed to a first step. While the, um, the, the, the um, uh, congressional delegation sort of in the Northeast, all closely tied to the Democratic Party, they, those were sort of, they were selected to run by the party before anything actually started up. And so I think that made for a more engaged citizenry and a more um, educated citizenry that, or that you were talking about that had opinions about who was running and how they right. were doing. Yeah, that's interesting. I think it also repudiated a line attributed to Lyndon Johnson about saying he'd like to see someone run for dog catcher first before they start you know, running for president or whatever. <laughs> So, well, let's turn to Hennel. Hennel, you were in, involved in a number of new, new things uh, through the work of the Institute for Social Justice. And uh, Ben sort of gave you an introduction uh, by saying vote by mail might be more powerful in the suburbs than in the urban areas. Uh, what, what was your experience? Because I know that you were advocating for the use of vote by mail, right? We were. So it's actually interesting. You know, um, we spent a lot of time earlier this year talking about why vote by mail is important. And it is. We need to, um, especially in this moment with COVID-19, that it's important to expand it and, um, and encourage people to utilize it. However, I, we actually spent a lot of time advocating for in-person polling places. Um, and it's exactly uh, what Ben mentioned is that, you know, um, when COVID hit, we had those local elections, and uh, there's not too many left in South Jersey, uh, too many municipalities that um, do um, local or school board elections in April, May, but there's still some strongholds in North Jersey that do it, including Newark. Um, so it was, there were, we knew there were going to be local elections then, and it was only vote by mail. And it was a, it was a problem. Um, we knew it created a lot of issues. There were, um, there were a lot of challenges with that, and we, that we spent a lot of time going, okay, fair enough. We absolutely need vote by mail this year. There's a public health crisis we're in, um, but we need in-person polling places because there are groups that, um, there are communities that cannot or will not vote by mail for a number of reasons. Um, ben touched on some of them. Um, there's historical disenfranchisement that people just don't, when, you, when you're used to not having your vote necessarily be, um, something you can rely on, something that as a right, um, you only trust it really if you can go in and make sure you're voting um, in front of an election official. Um, you're not going to trust another process in there. But there's other issues. Mail's not often as reliable in certain areas. Um, there's also issues with, um, you know, COVID-19, um, economic consequences. We talk about them a lot in terms of the economic part of it, but we don't necessarily talk about them um, as how they impact the election other than, oh, maybe people will vote one way or the other. But it also affects how people might be able to vote. We saw, we have just, it's often talked about that we're on the precipice of, um, of an eviction crisis. It's true, but it's also true that there's just been so much housing insecurity in the last, um, in this year. Uh, mm -hmm. tremendous amounts of it. People are just, because they can't afford it, they're moving. They're um, just leaving places that they're, um, that they're usually used to. They're sheltering in other places because of COVID-19. College students are remote right now when they usually register at um, college. Um, and just in a lot of different ways, a lot of demographics, people are just not where they're normally registered. So those are types of things that we saw a lot of. Um, and there are ways to address it. And that's why online voter registration was so tremendous this year. We finally got there. Um, we have online voter registration, which was huge. Um, and it's actually one of the stronger ones in the country, um, stronger systems in the country in terms of being voter friendly. 
Um, so that was great. Um, and it helped a lot because it allowed people to update their registration. But we only had it for about a six week window. So there were a lot of people um, kind of caught in that gap there. So, you know, you had a lot of people having to drive up and down the state to make sure their vote was um, they can cast their ballot, things like that. Um, as Ben mentioned, vote by mail is better for suburban white people. It just is. Um, and that's not just the case here in New Jersey, across the country. Um, it, it works really well, it's convenient, uh, but we need in-person polling places for a reason. So when we think about the future, and I know we're gonna talk about that a little later, but those are things to think about. What else we saw this election? And I'm gonna spend a minute talking about that because it is still this election, as Ingrid said, um, is the, um, part of expanding vote by mail was also making sure we had um, an infrastructure in place. <laughs> um, and that was new to New Jersey. And I will say the state, counties did a tr uh, just a, um, a really amazing job trying to, it, this, it was just a tremendous, tremendous burden they uh, we placed on them to have to just adapt and change everything that we're used to um, and kind of have that ready to go. One thing was um, that we do a deal with, with vote by mail and provisional ballots is a signature match. That's the security measure. It's to make sure that when you vote, they compare it to your voter file to make sure you're the one casting your ballot. That's great as a security measure, except it has some challenges. And I think everyone recognizes what they are. Signature match isn't exactly um, the most exact science. So, you know, we sued back in May to make sure we'd have a good process that led to a ballot cure procedure. I'm going to put the link um, in the chat box in a second so the audience can share. Um, it is, uh, there was a consent order in place for the primary. It's now law. Um, and we have a process. So the counties have to send a letter out to let you know that there was either your signature was missing or there was a mismatch, things like that. Um, and if so, you can cure that. Say, hey, this was this was my ballot, don't put it out. And um, you can return that by email, mail, fax, or in person, which again is a stronger cure procedure than we see in a lot of other states. We have a long time for it. We have until two days before certification. So November 18th, it is a receipt date, not a postmark date. So yeah, we have to all keep it in mind, but it is happening now. Um, we have another week for it. So please keep that in mind and look out for your signature and it can happen in anything. Honestly, it's there's a lot of dem um, there's a lot of groups that are disproportionately impacted. Um, older voters, for example, um, if you have um, a disability, young voter, there's a lot of groups that are impacted. But um, a lot of people in New Jersey, because we um, register right now, a lot of people have registered through um, MVC through automatic voter registration or online voter registration and you're you have an electronic signature and they're gonna have to compare it to your handwritten signature imagine uh, people can recognize how might that might be challenging uh, so please please look out for your cure form cure letter so that your vote counts so I'll mention that and then the other thing I'll also say about this election um, to keep in mind for our next conversation about things to address is all of this key um, the challenges we saw for vote by mail, um, we recognize this is why we needed in-person polling places, the groups that don't necessarily rely on vote by mail. Election day did not necessarily go, did not go as smoothly as it should have in New Jersey in some ways. Um, I will kind of contradict what Ben said earlier. We did actually see some long lines in a number of places, um, not everywhere. A lot of places around the state had no lines at all. There was just like one person coming in every hour and that's um, that's fair and that's great. However, in cities, there was often a line during a day that was an hour, two hours. Um, that's not that bad compared to some other states, but if you're know if you a voter in New Jersey, you know that's a lot. We don't usually vote us here in New Jersey because of our how, oft, um, how many polling places we have, which is a good thing. Um, there were several locations in Newark in a couple in Patterson that didn't open on time um, at 6 a.m. They took upwards of an hour and a half to open. So you had voters out in the cold waiting. Um, these are just challenges. There were places where it didn't have signs and voters had no idea how to get in. That's Those are just, um, you know, that happens. It's election management, but those are things we need to address and think about. We need to think about how um, drop boxes are selected and picked. Um, are there enough in places? So where you have Newark has only two drop boxes in the entire city um, and they're both near each other. Is that really uh, accessible? Lots of things like that we need to talk about, um, especially how they impact um, people. When we discuss laws, when we make policy, whether it's advocates, whether it's lawmakers, we often do it going, okay, look, this sounds great. This makes sense. These are some factors. We don't necessarily consider how that will work 
how the impact of what the impact of that'll be on communities themselves. And different communities do sometimes have different needs. And we really need to consider that when we're making these decisions, especially as we are a state that's so diverse. 45% of the state, over 45% of the state now is our communities of color. Um, that's just the reality. And it's also a lot of why uh, we've seen the shift in um, the congressional races that we were just talking about. There's a reason why and um, New Jersey 11th is um, now democratic. It is the shifting demographics has a huge role in that. Um, and that's true in a lot of places. So these are things we have to recognize because it absolutely has an impact on the political process, but we need to make sure voting rights are still there. Um, there was also a redistricting amendment and we're gonna be doing redistricting now. The redistricting amendment passed, we advocated against it. Um, um, to be, um, you know, all cards on the table here. Uh, we think delaying, we believe delaying redistricting is harmful for communities of color. It's also a permanent change. It's, it's, it's not the best drafted solution we have here, um, but it is the one we have. And we're gonna, we are now basically, I think everyone needs to recognize that redistricting is now. And we'll talk about more about how to participate in that, but uh, the commission's gonna be certified in about two and a half weeks. So we um, need to recognize that these are things that are happening now that are going to affect um, how representation works uh, for the next 10 years in our state. Uh, Hannah, can I ask you one thing? Uh, you worked very hard for um, people who were incarcerated and were on, uh, served their term and were, or are on uh, parole. Uh, um, and they were allowed to vote for the first time. They and were. I I was going to do a little bit of anything, and uh, just you can even just answer yes or no. Uh, did you see that enough of those individuals knew that they could vote and did show up, or is that something we look ahead to? We look ahead to doing more. We definitely need to yeah. do more. There were a lot of people who do, and we definitely saw good participation for it. But mm -hmm. there are definitely things we need to do to uh, make sure people um, actually know about this right. It's difficult. Um, when you consider, I agree, someone mentioned earlier, um, people are much more aware of the political process right now than we saw in the past, and that's huge, but there's still a lot of gaps and complications here. People don't recognize that voting laws are different state by state, for one. So you hear about cha about um, rights, about, um, about um, disenfranchisement, right? That people with criminal convictions can't vote. And you hear about that in other states. Other states that prosecute people who don't know, um, who unintentionally registered, um, didn't even realize an issue. And then you have more people really skeptical. No one wants to violate their parole by registering to vote. That's such a huge, um, um, the, the penalty is just so high. So people tend to be skeptical. So you need an actual process to make sure that education is happening. People know about their rights. We saw um, people read, people voted this year who've never, um, uh, never been able to vote in their life because they got caught up in the system so um, before they were 18. So it's, it's tremendous and we're so happy about it. Um, but it's definitely looking forward how we're making sure everybody who now has the right to vote knows and can uh, meaningfully um, register and vote. Is that okay, well, thank thanks for all of that. And uh, Charlie, so what did you write about this election? <laughs> oh, just about everything from, um, of course, the Trump factor to the congressional races, Chris Christie and his COVID crisis. So uh, we took a sidetrack on that. Um, a, a couple of points, were excellent points were made. Uh, and one, ironically, uh, Hanal is right about that. It's, um, you know, the vote by mail affects suburban white people. Or it benefits them, but uh, somebody ought to send that memo to the Republican Party, particularly here <laughs> in New Jersey, who um, the, the GOP today in Trenton, just uh, uh, Bob Singer, a senator from Ocean County, introduced uh, a constitutional amendment that would require people to actually uh, write and, uh, and request a vote by mail ballot uh, form in the future. Um, it's just it's just completely ignoring the reality that's around them. They're trying to basically shove the toothpaste back in the tube on this issue, and it's not going to happen. Point John made that was very good too was about the um, lack of legislators running for Congress, and I think that really points to the way the New Jersey legislature is is structured under the leadership. Uh, ever since the leadership pacts 
uh, were formed in 1993, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. um, the the only legislators that get to shine are a handful of uh, leaders, uh, the leadership, the speaker, the assembly speaker, and maybe, maybe the minority leadership. Um, and so everybody else is just a uh, rubber stamp, you know, and shoved into the shadows and it doesn't get a chance to build a profile, especially, and we saw that especially under uh, Chris Christie where they, the Republican party had their grand hero. And then uh, as soon as he takes office, he puts him, you know, backstage. So uh, I thought that was really kind of an interesting uh, point. I think the, one of the things I really was interested in this race, particularly in the fallout in the congressional races is the, uh, the impact on the state, New Jersey state GOP in the era of Trump. I mean, amid all this rubble of the Trump election, where does um, the GOP go from here? Uh, and it's an important question I, and because New Jersey does need a robust um, party, a two party system. And right now we have a robust one party system with its own fissures and challenges. But um, where does this party go? Do you know, frankly, if you look at the vote totals, I, I mean, Trump still got 41, 42 percent of the vote here. And that's going to be very hard for future Republican office seekers, um, including the, the candidates for governor next year to ignore. So how are they going to embrace Trumpism, even though most of the general electorate finds it loathsome? So they are in a real uh, they're in they're in a real challenge. And I think that's going to be a very interesting um, uh, a dilemma for them. If you talk to some of the old establishment Republican parties, I think the answer is simple. Just, you know, refute Trumpism in all its forms, stand up for your establishment, moderate Republican establishment principles. And like Christy Whitman did and say, you know, get lost. We want not, we don't want anything to do with you. But I don't think, frankly, that's a realistic uh, uh, posture for, again, candidates. So I think that was um, very interesting. And uh, I, I also was also taken by the Kennedy Van Drew race. I thought that was one of the most fascinating races. Fascinating, lowercase f, fascinating. It's just interesting, maybe is a better word. But um, they, I, I mean, I, I think one of the things that gets lost in this is um, that Kennedy, her name, that that, Ken, that Kennedy dynastic allure was actually absolutely turned out to be useless. Uh, the Monmouth poll found that mo almost 60% of the um, uh, voters in that district said it wasn't going to matter. And she, the, the thing that really did matter um, for her would have been her own family name recognition in Atlanta County. And uh, I don't think that really turned out to be that much of, a, of an advantage. I frankly think she was really harmed by COVID. Of all the candidates in the field, I think she was harmed the most by COVID because she couldn't get out there and really um, stump in a, re a conventional retail way. Whereas Van Drew was showing up at everybody with a mask on, showing up at everybody's barbecue, a la Jim McGreevy. Jim McGreevy had that reputation of showing up at everybody's barbecue, whether he was invited or not. And Van Drew does the same thing in Cumberland and Cape May counties. And he had name recognition. He was a you know, he, he was not seen as a, you know, uh, uh, um, a toxic, even though he flip-flopped and she painted him as a traitor in the ad, somebody who can't be trusted and put his own interests ahead of everybody else first. He had deep-rooted name recognition and, um, and that really paid off for him. I, I talked to somebody who worked on his earliest campaigns for committee men in Dennis Township, and they said it from the start, Jeff Van Drew would write congratulation letters to every high school graduate in his district. Starting, I mean, now that sounds kind of like corny and schmaltzy, but people put it on their refrigerators. You know, parents go make their coffee and more pour, pour the milk out, and they can get a little glow from him. Hey, my local cop, my local assemblyman, my state senator is like 
pulled a little and gave my son special recognition. But that was just as emblematic. He would just do things like that. And I don't, frankly, I think Amy, Amy Kennedy is, a, it's got a lot of promise for as a future, but she was her inexperience, frankly, in a couple times also show, uh, showed. And I think this is also true with David Richter in the third district. Um, so I think that the, the interesting uh, thing going forward is the Republican party and also uh, the governor's race next year, how this is going to play out. I think, uh, Phil Murphy is going to be is in a, in a is in the driver's seat on this election. He has a, a strong Democratic electorate. Um, he you know doesn't seem to have he has competition that's going to have to wrangle with this identity crisis. And frankly, there's a good chance of the COVID crisis, which he's which has kind of enhanced his stature, is going to be in somewhat begin pulling into the rear view mirror as he uh, goes into reelection. And if the, if the news about the vaccines we got uh, yesterday are true, then it, he'll be able to stand at the uh, head of that parade when the vaccines come in, the virus abates and the economy starts to cook. So I think he's going to, I think he's going to be very tough to beat. And I'll end it there because I can go on and on and on and on. Please. Okay. Stop. No, no, no. You, 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 yeah. You've got us into now talking yeah. about as you did. <laughs> But I, I, do, I do think that it's hard to believe that the Republicans had a primary to the bitter end for who was going to run against Booker uh, <laughs> and missed that whole primary period of getting the whoever the candidate was going to be uh, out and about and, and meeting people. And the same thing happened in the third district where they had this really contentious uh, primary and uh, and spent a lot of money and, and missed an opportunity to do a I lot agree. of meaning, even though it was, you know, COVID time and you couldn't get out. So you'd have to wonder, is can they focus on one candidate early enough so that um, uh, there might be a form, more formidable candidate? And with with that, I think I'm going to turn it over uh, to uh, I don't know who wants to talk about the gubernatorial race before we get back to some of the issues that Hennel raised about what are we going to do about voting. What do you, what do you think, John? Well, I mean, you know, the, the history of governor governor's races in New Jersey is well, the history of governor's races across the country is incumbents get reelected. About eighty percent of governors who run for reelection get reelected. In New Jersey, governors always get reelected as long as they're a Republican. And they, in these recent decades, always get defeated if they're a Democrat. So it's not that that jinxes uh, Murphy in any way, but it's it, he would be the first governor since Brendan Byrne to be re Democratic. Be <laughs> That's right. re -elected. I, I do think if, if COVID starts to recede as, as a threat and as an issue, the state's economy and the, the, the status of it and the bond ratings and and all of that would be fertile ground for a good Republican nominee or candidate. Mm -hmm. um, but I think Charlie's point is is excellent of whether whether there's a way to pull the Republican Party together to make to mount a credible challenge to a Democratic nominee who we know is going to be well funded and, and have a and, and has a high profile and now I think has a high profile nationally as well. Well, didn't you mention in um, in the morning after program that that there is a, a history in New Jersey of uh, that 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 is just it seems to be embedded in our atmosphere that you you, uh, you don't even have a fair chance of uh, being a Democratic governor <laughs> if a Democratic president has been elected. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, the, the elections come sufficiently infrequently that you can make generalizations from too, too few data points. But, but that is one, that every, every, every four years we elect a president, and then New Jersey a year later elects a governor of the other party. So mm -hmm. most recently it was Trump getting elected in 2016 and then Murphy in 2017. Mm -hmm. So that would be another, whatever you call it, that Murphy would break if it were he to be really. <laughs> Uh, uh, I'd like to ask you uh, whether two things that happened in this election are going to be issues uh, 
I think one won't be a big issue, but it'll be an issue among people who are informed, good government and so on. But uh, the marijuana uh, ballot issue was voted overwhelmingly uh, that people wanted that. Is, is, is it going to be contentious if they start having to work on the implementation and who gets what? And uh, are we going to be able to deal with the justice issue? Because what was not on the ballot was whether having uh, marijuana be legal would mean that you would deal with the, uh, the justice issue of all the people who are imprisoned because they're there because they were using it or selling it. Uh, when it wasn't legal. Uh, is that something that the public cares about? Is it likely to come up? And then, of course, there's also the redistricting issue. I don't think people really got it, what that ballot question was all about. I don't know if you disagree, if you agree or disagree. But, I um, mean, those are two things that happened right now, and I wonder if they're going to have anything uh, to be in the public mind in the next year. Well, I think the marijuana initiative, well, for one thing, initiatives in New Jersey seem to pass, which wasn't always the case. So there were three on the ballot this year, and I don't think anybody knew much about the third one. And not, as you say, not many people knew about the redistricting one. Um, but there are a thousand issues around legalizing marijuana. And, and it, to me, without a lot of knowledge of it, I would think letting people out of prison who were there for marijuana violations, pardoning them would be the one of the easier ones that you know, the people of the state have spoken and said this isn't something that should be criminal, and uh, but all the questions of of where where stores are and what the rules are uh, for selling it and all that um, are complicated. New Jersey benefits from having a whole lot of states that have gone before us, so we should and and I think New Jersey. I know New Jersey has had an assistant commissioner in Department of Health, Jeff Brown working on marijuana, uh, medical marijuana, and now was just named director of the new Cannabis Commission. So there's been a lot of groundwork done in the Murphy administration that they should be able to anticipate at least some of the problems that are gonna come up. Uh, uh, ben, what do you make of, of, of all of this? Um, uh, do, will people pay attention or will, <laughs> will they uh, no, just worry about their property taxes as, as we believe in New Jersey is the only thing that people worry about? No, it, look, it, it, it's, it's going to matter because it'll affect different people's neighborhoods. You know, the moment if you've anybody who's been to Massachusetts and, uh, and sees the dispensaries in, in located in different places, um, you know, can say like, okay, that's right there. Um, but I think what's interesting here is one of the interesting parts about this is that the legislature tried to do it legislatively um, and they couldn't figure it out. They couldn't agree. Um, it certainly employed a lot of lobbyists. Uh, the cannabis industry sort of seemed to hire everybody uh, who's a registered lobbyist on West State Street in Trenton, uh, where most of them have their offices. But they couldn't do it. And like virtually every other state, they had to go to a referendum. Um, yeah. There were too many folks, um, even folks who otherwise you would say, this is a very, very progressive person uh, in the legislature. On this issue, no. This issue, they couldn't have it. Now with the political cover of 60 plus percent of the public saying, yes, we're okay with this, all right, now they're going to start really dealing with location and location uh, in relation to hospitals, in relation to schools, in relation to daycare centers, um, funding, where the money goes, how do right. communities of color um, participate in this? Is this just going to be effectively, as some have argued, a white dominated investor class money making opportunity? And the communities that have suffered the most, which you can make the very real argument, has been, you know, and appropriately so, uh, have been these communities of color, particularly in urban areas. Um, what benefits are they getting uh, out of this? Is the money coming back? Is the tax money coming back to them? Are there issues about ownership, uh, shared ownership, percentage ownership um, for uh, people of color? So all this stuff is now got to get reconciled um mm -hmm. but it's being done the reason they uh you know i think it'll be a little bit easier 
um, is that they've now got the political cover. Uh, just look, the public approved it. So I understand a whole bunch of my seniors in my district are going to yell at me about this because they still think of it as a gateway drug, as many uh, people of a certain generation grew up understanding. Um, but now they'll be able to say yes, but listen, it got approved. So now I get to do it. Now I'm going to, uh, we're going to sort of have votes on this stuff. Um, so there's going to be a lot of advocacy and a lot of, uh, very robust debates. I think the public will pay attention once a dispensary shows up in your neighborhood, if it does. Okay. Can I add to that, um, Ingrid? I think all those points are excellent. And I I, I do think, though, we got to keep in mind we're going to have all 120 seats of the legislature up this year and the governor's mm -hmm. race. And I think the big issue out of that whole stew that Ben uh, talked about is taxation and um, and and also where you locate. And I think these are really thorny issues. And let's not forget also the law enforcement issue. How is this going to, how will police be able to, um, uh, be, you know, when they stop a car and they smell an odor of, uh, of marijuana, how is that all, how are they gonna be able to test somebody? These are very complicated issues um, and I, I, there's a good chance that a lot of the issues that snarled this to begin with, a lot of the, those dynamics um, are going to force this, force a big punt to 2022 on a lot of this. I'm, I mean, that's, that might be a worst case scenario. I do think a good sign, however, is the decriminalization mm -hmm. legislation that's moving. Uh, I, I think that takes a big, the, the big social justice, social inequity, unfairness issue, I think that uh, that brought a lot of voters, a lot of Democratic voters to the table, even reluctant suburban voters. They may mm -hmm. say, may have said to themselves, I'm not big about this idea of having marijuana everywhere, but you know, it really is grossly everywhere. unfair. <laughs> it, it's been, the way it's been enforced is really unfair. Every, you know, usage is the same up between black and whites, but blacks are arrested, incarcerated three times more. So I think that decriminalizing that and, and that's moving on its own track is important. But I think a lot of these thorny issues are going to be, there's a possibility you'll see a big punt until 2022. Okay. Um, Hedl raised the question of what are we going to do in voting? And I, I'm not even, uh, I think you would all agree that we have to see what we did in this election. And if we're going to do vote by mail again, we have to take another look at how it's done uh, uh, and and solve a lot of the other uh, issues that go along with, with that and uh, refine that. Um, but Hennel, I just wanted to give you a, a chance to say one word while I ask him, do you have questions lined up for us? Yeah, I'll just say um, to kind of touch on the conversation we just had, there are, there are some thorny issues happening right now. There are some really tricky issues and that could impact a lot of things next year. As um, Charlie just mentioned, there's a lot of a, lot, a number of elections next year, all of the state elections essentially. Um, and you know, I don't think it's discussed that much, but in 2017 and 2018, when we had the last two times we had a statewide election without a presidential election, um, Bill Murphy and Bob Menendez lost the white vote. Um, Based on election, I mean, uh, there, at least based on exit polling, I might be wrong on this. So, if, if, if other experts here can please uh, correct me. But um, it's it's an interesting thing to walk into. Last um, 2017, Bill Murphy won 94 percent of the black vote. So, when we're looking at how you're um, positioning a re-election next year, it really matters what, how uh, policies, how issues impact your base, <laughs> um, and are they gonna come out and vote? Will they vote for the other side of the second question? Um, so I think those are things that we need to consider. So that includes, do they have access to the vote? So I think I'm just gonna try to touch of a few things that I think are really crucial that if anyone's in, um, interested in voting that we need to really touch on in the next few months. Um, and uh, please reach out if you uh, wanna help. Um, you can reach out to me at the Institute, but first, we need um, electronic poll books, we just do. Um, electronic poll books is a super wonky issue, but what it does is it will allow us to send ballots to everybody, vote by mail ballots to everybody, and allow in-person voting on a machine. 
saves a lot of time for the counties and makes things accessible. So we need them. There is some, there's bill movements. There is some movement happening. We need to do it. We need same day registration. We just do. The to over 20 states in the country have it. There are so many people who are just disenfranchised because of, of, of our 21 day arbitrary deadline. We need this. We need to expand AVR. We need to expand it to, um, to other agencies, to Medicaid. We can, our law, our law allows it um, to Medicaid, to Department of Corrections, to parole board, get, um, make it easy to register for people who now have the right to vote. These are things that are really important and make a difference. And the last thing, and I think we need to start having a conversation about that we're looking into, and if anyone's interested, please reach out, is um, a Voting Rights Act, a state equivalent of one, a New Jersey Voting Rights Act, so we can actually address how a lot of these things we're seeing in certain cities and certain areas disproportionately affect people. Those are ways to actually um, address them and get some recourse. Um, and then the last thing is we're going to see how redistricting goes. Um, right. Just, I'll note that everyone, it's important to participate, participate in this. Um, the commission's going to start. There will be a, at least hopefully more, but there will be some public hearings. Participate, make your voice heard in it. Okay, thanks, Hal. All right, yeah, Kim, we have a little time for questions. Yeah, we, we, and we have some questions. Pam Wakefield asks, do you think COVID suppressed voting more for Democrats than for Republicans? Okay, that's a, I can give a one, uh, one word answer. Yes or no, an opinion? I haven't seen any evidence that there was a partisan distinction uh, mm -hmm. between COVID. Um, you know, Democrats, I think we have seen evidence that Democrats used the vote by mail process, which stemmed from the COVID situation, and they took yeah. advantage of that. Um, Republicans less so, but not all Republicans. Lots of Republicans did, you know, use vote yeah. by mail too. Um, to the degree that there was a partisan difference in Republicans showing up on election day, they didn't care about COVID. I mean, I don't think we're looking at um, the, you know, Republicans had strong turnout. There were more Democrats, but it's not like the Republicans didn't show up. Um, so I don't I haven't really seen a distinction um, yet uh, in terms of who would uh, at least negatively uh, uh, affected. It, in terms of policy wise, it, you know, I think it was clear that on the presidential level, Joe Biden wanted to talk about the president's response to COVID. And to that degree, COVID had an effect right. on yeah, right. the election. <laughs> took the right, words right out of my mouth, Ben. Okay. Well, that's why we're brilliant you just, guys. You just so. do it more articulately than I do. <laughs> All right, Kim, another one? Uh, yes. Um, so we have th three more at the moment. Might the results lead to any change in the power of the Sweeney Norcross machine? From Bob Schwartz. Oh, my heavens. Is that? I, well, I, I could try that one. I mean, I, I've been, <laughs> that's a tough one. I, I think to some degree, uh, their machine is a little bit, uh, you know, weakened right now. I've, maybe it's maybe they're bringing it into the shop for retooling, but um, I think they've lost some. Uh, they got thumped in some legislative races last year in the in South Jersey. Um, their candidate in the primary uh, in the legislative district two. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, um, excuse me. I'm sorry. Congressional <laughs> District. Um, Bridget Harrison was defeated, even though they all lined up lockstep behind her, except for Atlanta County. Um, I think Ocean was another one that was uh, not on the line. That was not as significant. Um, and they've been under siege from uh, Governor uh, Murphy's uh, tax uh, incentive investigation panel, that outside panel he created, has created a lot of legal uh, uh, scrutiny and focus that I think has kind of thrown them off a little bit. So, and I, and so, and I think that's led to, because you, that dovetails also with uh, Murphy's ascendancy during COVID. His, his uh, uh, handling of it has been widely embraced by the public. He's got, at one point he had approval ratings as high as 70%. And I think this has fostered an environment by which um, it's created a kind of uh, 
I don't say maybe a detente um, or, or more of a willingness to work with the governor. It also helps that the governor's has a more uh, wily uh, chief of staff in George Helmy, who has a lot of, um, you know, uh, seems to have had a lot of ties or ab ability to talk to and connections with a wide range of Democrats around the state. He was former field director for Cory Booker. So I think the environment is one more of cooperation. And I think you'll we'll see some evidence of this. I think Matt Friedman may alluded to this today in his Politico roundup about the, uh, the lineup in the redistricting, the Democratic lineup. And will that will there be representatives from the South on there? And if they're if they're if they are included, that really is more evidence that there's more uh, cooperation. I'll add one note yeah. there. Sorry, I, go. Um, it, one <laughs> redistricting one redistricting note is population in the last ten years has shifted north um, in New Jersey. The uh, the greatest growth in New Jersey has been in the Hudson Essex uh, County area. Um, and other areas in North Jersey. I don't know how that'll play out. We'll see how the map goes, but it's it probably will have some. If I can just jump in two quick <laughs> things, yeah, that I think uh, might be a little juicy for the uh, for the folks here. Um, one, just on redistricting, the best thing that happened to the Norcross Sweeney machine is that Jeff Andrew won, because if you had to go into the congressional redistrict and protect Amy Kennedy, yeah, you'd have a hard time doing that without hurting Andy Kim. Andy Kim mm -hmm. wants to dump Ocean County pieces and you yeah. can't move it, but now you've got a Republican district down there, fine, yeah. it's there. So in, an, in a weird sense, this is, it makes it a little bit easier uh, for the South Jersey Democrats. The other thing that I, um, this is the best rumor that I heard all week. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's actually kind of true. Mm -hmm. If, so, a President <laughs> yeah. Biden, I think, is going to seriously consider Congressman Donald Norcross for Secretary of Labor. Uh -huh. And by moving him, there's a lot of union support, union member. Those who don't know Donald Norcross, um, he has the same last name, but he has a different character, uh, at least because he's the elected official uh, than his uh, brother Donald. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, George, excuse me, his brother George. Um, he is a union electrician. I think he's going to get a lot of union, of uh, national union support. But just implicate understanding this: if you take Donald Congressman Donald Norcross out of the first congressional district and put him in Washington, that opens up a congressional seat for none other than Steve Sweeney, right? Which gets him out of Trenton, which allows people to It'll at least chaos. think differently, you know, mm -hmm. uh, about. Who runs it? This is not to say that the South Jersey Democratic Organization will not have a strong influence, but to the degree that we've had Steve Sweeney there for over for a decade, uh, for mm -hmm. more than a decade now, this m is the potential to move things around, and this is all going to happen in the next couple of weeks. So you that's something. Someone would want to want to the most powerful person in those um, in the state Senate to the, the one of the least powerful people in the um, U.S. House. Yes, yes. Yeah, because well, the I, fact I, I, is, and I'll tell you why, this is why Sweeney would do it if he decides to, um, because it's it's more money, there's like, you know, there's more perks to, to that world uh, there. I mean, he gets a state driver, so that's kind of nice, but he'll get that uh, if he's there. But I think he's not governor, and he wants to be governor, well, and he can't be governor there. He's stuck. Yeah. Um, and I think that would make it like, you know, let me get out for a while, do something else, and then we'll see where things are. Well, I, I, the last I, time I, the U.S. Labor I, Commissioner. Charlie, let, John, let John have a say. Oh, yeah. I, I was going to say the last time New Jer the Secretary of Labor came from New Jersey, it didn't work out that well. <laughs> well <laughs> you know, know, Ray Donovan eventually will get his reputation back as he did. <laughs> I wanted to say on, on Ben's point, I, I reported that about a month ago, and it was played to me that oh, oh, everything you say is correct, but it, it was also kind of suggested to me that this was an indirect way of George Norcross communicating to Steve Sweeney, look, you're right, this idea that you're going to run for governor, it's not happening. It's not happening. Maybe with the help of the Carpenters Union, which was really pushing this, and it's and the Carpenters Union is very close to Norcross, 
they were they were pushing Donald for a labor secretary that we, we got a soft, maybe a soft landing for you over here in Congress, but the governor's office, that's probably not going to happen. And it was, you know, a nice kind of passive aggressive way. I never thought in this day I would ever attribute passive aggressive behavior to George Norcross, but it was a passive aggressive way of telling his longtime buddy, Steve, he's not going to be there for him for, for running for a governor if he really wanted to push it. But well, everything you said, Ben Drake, is dead on, spot on. If Sweeney was in Congress, he could run for governor repeatedly without risking his seat. That's the other thing. Uh, oh, right. that's a nice, oh, very nice, oh, very good. See, this guy, chess master, we got over here. We all heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> what if you had, if you had been like better than me and read Charlie's column a month ago, maybe you'd know no, about this. No, that's, that, oh, that's I just, thought this was new. I heard about this a month ago. <laughs> no, that shows you how Gannett is very. Well, I don't want to start complaining about our market. <laughs> I, I think it's, it's a problem. A, it's a, a problem. Good, a good segue into yeah. the fact that we've just put in the chat a lot of links. Um, so if you want to mm -hmm. learn more about what each of the panelists does or to be the first to know by reading Charlie mm -hmm. Styles, uh, mm -hmm. you can click on these links to find out. Um, and there's also something about ballot curing, um, which isn't coming up as a link, but is there. The okay. last question, which you may opt to answer or not is this is likely not a question you all can answer but the title of this program is what do the election results mean in new jersey as noted about 41 percent of us voted for trump 58 percent voted for biden it's not 50 50 but moving forward what does this mean philosophically for new jersey anybody have a one of yeah, a set of that? i'll I'll go first if that's okay. Um, okay. Look, I, New Jersey is blue and getting bluer. Um, and we just should understand that. Um, uh, 13 years ago, 2007, registered Democrats outnumbered registered Republicans statewide by about 290,000. So there was a Democratic advantage, but you had 2.4 million or so, 2.6 million at that point, um, unaffiliated voters. And so Republicans understood, you know, oh, we're a little bit behind, but we can go. Today, 13 years later, registered Democrats outnumber registered Republicans by 1.1 million. Mm -hmm. There are now more registered Democrats than unaffiliated voters by about 100,000. It is a stunning growth in terms of partisanship, which we might think doesn't necessarily matter, but it's an increasingly partisan world. I think one of the points that, you know, we, I, I didn't quite get into the gubernatorial next year conversation, but let me just add this point. Um, Donald Trump may well leave the White House, um, but he isn't leaving the Republican Party. Um, mm -hmm. And so all of these potential uh, Republican candidates are going to have to deal with him still on the stage um, and him still, you know, Donald Trump still tweeting. And that is going to make a difference, uh, whether you're Steinhardt, the state Republican chair is talking about running, uh, John Bramnick, the assembly Republican leader is talking about running, Jack Cettarelli, the former assemblyman who ran uh, four years ago and uh, a few years ago and wants to run again. Um, you know, he lost the nomination uh, to Kim Guadano. And he's already announced. So all of these folks have to figure out where they're going to be in terms of what they represent as the future of the party, but Donald Trump is still gonna be there and that motivates Democrats. That's the point. The large Democratic population identifying, I have a D next to my name in the voter rolls are more motivated when we're not just talking about potholes and my state taxes <laughs> where, all right, yeah, I can vote for a Republican because I don't like what I'm, the affordability in New Jersey. But if That's Trump exactly. is yeah. in the dynamic it, it nationalizes, it creates a different aura. And this is why we may well see a case where, hey, the per the, guber the, guber uh, the gu gubernatorial winner the year after a presidential election is somebody of the opposite party. So if Biden wins now, we expect that he is winning, he has won. Um, it, it's likely a Republican might win next year. Yes, except there's still Trump. And he's going to be there. So even if Biden is unpopular in a year, Donald Trump is going to not be quiet. And that throws a whole new dynamic. And that's why the partisan advantage of 1.1 million voters in New Jersey 
that's going to, uh, I think, have a bigger impact in a gubernatorial election than it would have in, even in past years. You just saved me okay. a phone call for my for my Monday column, Ben. I'm so, I'm just, <laughs> I said I just saved me all this work. It's fantastic. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> let's just check with John and Hal. Do you buy basically that uh, uh, analysis? Or uh, I can't. Or Hennel, I there's another factor in in that election that has to be taken into consideration. So let's dock at that. Um, well, I was just struck by the the those are the three people. Pe three Republicans people talk about running and it doesn't give the Republican party a lot of diversity. And you start out with three white men, but mm -hmm. well, Murphy's another one. So there we are. Yeah. That's uh, right. well, yeah, that's an institutional problem. You know, this yeah. also, this uh, conjuring the ghost of Trump and it, which it won't be hard because he'll be there. This is, <laughs> they're going to play that this, it's not, this is going to be a replay of what the Republicans did. I mean, Democrats did in New Jersey and elsewhere in the late nineties with Newt Gingrich. Every year for a couple of years, it was Newt Gingrich or the NRA seemed to be the boogeyman that they used every year, even though there wasn't any specific issue. Even after Gingrich had uh, went down, they were still invoking the name of Gingrich. So they're going to do the same thing with Trump, although he's going to make it a lot easier for him. So, Hennel, do you want to add to this? No. I'll just say I'll just say that in terms of this election, I think the more underrated things are, I think nationally, one thing we're going to see more of, unfortunately, is we're going to see a surge of more voter suppression um, in a lot of states. And there is that's not something we can do a lot of from here in New Jersey, um, except that I do think you're going to need one way to address that is to expand democracy in places to actually show as like an actual counter model as like things that we care about and show that it's something we uh, if we value and that's important and then the other thing is i do think and uh john and charlie just touched on it we're gonna get to a point and look it is that it's the type of thing that most communities of color understand and are just used to like i mean the, but at some point it's going to be a question that the fact that the state is run by white men um it's just a reality and at some point it's going to be, hey, what does that mean and how um, how does that work when we are a state that's almost half um, people of color and um, the Democratic Party, which is in control is in terms of voters is more so than that. And how does that work? I think it's going to start being something that really makes a difference. I will say um, to touch on that Senate race, nobody, we kind of, um, that really nobody, that didn't get attention. I think it was the first time we've had a statewide race where it was two people of color who were running against each other. Yeah. Um, so it's moving that way. And I think that's the type of thing we're going to start seeing more of. So for Republican party, I think it is a conversation broadly around the country, but especially in New Jersey to how to survive is to start expanding the base. Um, and expanding to other groups a little bit. Um, otherwise, and yes, Donald Trump is going to remain an issue. And uh, to your point, um, to Charlie, what Charlie just said, I think one thing that's going to make it a little, um, I guess, easier for Democrats, harder for Republicans to get past is that Donald Trump might, might continue to spend a lot of time in New Jersey. Um, he spent a lot of summers here, um, and he <laughs> might continue to do that. And it makes it, he'll be right here to point to. So. Okay. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I dread <laughs> I, I, running into into him at the shop right in Montgomery. I always had that nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> and it's possible because that's a county, same county, right? It is. Yep. Uh, I think, Kim, that you're probably looking at the time that we have exceeded, and uh, and since you seem to indicate that that was the last question, I, I think it's time to thank our panel, thank them for uh, living in the now, and. Um, and giving us a sense of what will be there in the future. And so we'll just have to organize another panel for 2021. So thank you to the library and the, to the adult school for making this all possible. And particularly thank you, you, Kim Dorman, thanks. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you I enjoyed it. Thank you, everyone. Nice meeting you, Hanel, and everybody. Nice meeting you. Yeah, Hanel, we'll be in touch. I want to talk to you soon.